You are listening to the official podcast of Mosaic San Diego, a community that exists to live by faith, to be known by love, and to be a voice of hope. Um, what an incredible time to be together. I don't know about you. Uh, first of all, if we've never met, my name's Derek, and I'm, I'm really, really glad to be with you this morning. I had a week of all weeks. I don't know about you. It has been a crazy week, uh, not only for our country and, and all of the craziness that's going on and all of the uh, controversy and, and, and pent-up energy and and there's a lot we're going to get there this morning. Um, but I personally had just uh, uh, a week that I was not expecting. Um, I got a call on Tuesday morning of a family crisis, a family emergency that I had to drop everything for and step into. And I had a book of flight. I've never done that in my life where I just uh, knew I had to drop everything and, and literally go to the airport and just get on an airplane and, and change my schedule and and abandon everything else that I had to do with my own life. And, and um, it's been a whirlwind. And I'll tell you what, when, when I went into that situation uh, this week, I, I felt so sorry for myself. Um, I, I just felt like the, the burden of the world was on my shoulders, and I, I had to handle it all by myself, and I had all of this uh, empathy for myself. Um, and uh, it was amazing, the pivot, uh, the, the change that took place over the course of a few days in my own life. Um, and I think that, that what I experienced this week is really my longing and my hope for us as a people in this nation that we could experience the same kind of pivot that I'm, I'm working through. But I want to step into something this morning. This is not a talk that I had planned. This is not a talk that... Um, that, that I had been thinking about for long, but basically I woke up yesterday morning and said, there's something on my heart that I need to get out. And um, if you follow me on social media, you know that I'm not very active other than pictures of my kids, and they're pretty bad pictures. Um, I need an iPhone 7, my 6 just ain't cutting it. But, um, but yeah, I, I'm not, uh, not an Instagrammer per se, and and I'm absolutely not active on, on, on Facebook. In fact, if you wanted to figure out where I stood on any sort of political thing or that, it would be very, very difficult to, to figure that out on my social media. Um, but it is not hard to figure that out on most of yours. And, um, and so it's been a whirlwind of a week um, sorting through all of this. And what's interesting to me is that I've had so much indictment uh, from friends, from people that I love on my own life because I'm not active. And, and so I, I get this pushback that because I'm not active or I'm not outspoken that I must not care. And, and um, so this, basically this morning, this is my open letter to you. This is my response uh, to, to all of the stuff that's going on. And I'm going to try to do it with grace. So I need your grace. Um, if you've been paid any attention to to the news this week or to your friends on, on social media, you know that uh, if you had to pick one word, one word to describe the state of our country, the state of our nation, the state of our friendships, the state of our families, uh, the one word that I would use is just polarized. We're just polarized, right? It's this polarizing thing. And now, I, I got to be honest, I love polarized sunglasses. They're amazing. Once you go to polarized lenses, you'll never go back. You'll never do it. Um, and polarized is a great thing in a set of sunglasses, but it's a terrible thing in a relationship. It is a terrible thing in our country. It is a terrible thing in our church. And, and I, know, I, I know that it can feel right at times to stake your claim, to stand your ground, to fight for what you believe, and your passions are so good. But... What I've discovered, and I even experienced this in my own life as I navigated this family crisis of my own this week, that passion without poise is dangerous. And in fact, we, we call acts of crime, we call them acts of passion. 
right? That crimes that weren't premeditated, you act on things out of your passion and passion without poise, it could become a dangerous thing. And when you, when you step into something guns blazing without considering the other side, it, it, it can propagate what we're experiencing right now in our country and in our church, in our relationships. And, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, then God bless you. Um, <laughs> But, you know, it's interesting to me that I feel like we're just at a loss because we have convictions, and convictions are so good, and, and, and it's good to have conviction. It's, it's so good to be educated, to have a stance, and to fight for what's right, and there's been so many beautiful expressions of that that have happened. Um, but, but what's interesting to me is, is there's this, this phenomenon that takes place in, in life where if you aren't getting through to someone... Uh, you just say it louder, right? And, and this happens to me at work all the time. Where, where I work as a fireman, and we run calls, on, medical calls, all the time. And, and when we get to a call where a patient speaks a different language, uh, we quickly establish that. If it's Spanish, we try to fumble through it, and we can do okay. But if it's anything else, uh, we, we quickly realize that we are not going to get through to each other. There's no way to get through to each other. But we still try. We just talk louder in English. It's like if we just try to talk louder that they'll understand what we're saying. Or if you slow down and say it louder, if you're more articulate, they might understand what you're saying. And this is what we're doing in our country right now. We aren't getting through to each other. There are these polarized camps. There are, are these encampments of people who cannot get through to each other. They are speaking different languages. And instead of trying to understand each other so that we can get through to them, instead of stepping into a kind of moment where we actually have a translator if we need one, we just yell at each other and we just get louder and louder and louder. And it only increases the chasm between us. I love that it's true that there are two sides to every coin. But, but you know what's between those two sides? On a penny, it's 1.5 millimeters. We act as if the, the differences between us are these, these gigantic chasms and that we could never come around to understanding each other. But if you, if you use the coin metaphor, there's actually very little that separates us. And what we see is we see this, this, this ideology or this... Maybe it's a phenomenon of humanity where, where birds of feather flock together, right? You, you, you find people like you and you surround, you create allies, you link arms and, and, and you, you start to at least find people who agree with you. And it feels good. But, but I think we forget sometimes that we humans, we are incredibly complex. Like you might agree on one issue, but you haven't talked about the 50 other ones that you're adamantly opposed on. And then when you figure it out, you're linked up, you have your camp, you've created this circle with your people on this thing. And then you find out, oh, this other thing, oh, we're different. And that often comes through a Facebook post, and you're like, this crisis of friendship, I can't believe you stand on that, or I can't believe you think that, or I can't believe you shared that, or like that. We don't even take it from the horse's mouth, we just assume we just assume that each other's whole makeup is defined by this thing or that thing. And it's creating this division, this dissension in our friendships, in our relationships. But I think that there's actually a different phenomenon in life, in the created order, in the laws of nature that I think is actually a more compelling narrative for us. It's this idea that not only is it true that in some arenas and in most ways, birds of a feather flock together, but there's this other phenomenon, this, this reality that in some cases, opposites attract. And if you look at magnets, they're fascinating. My, my buddy actually, he, he started a company called Tegu Toys where he created these wood blocks and they're like Legos, but they're magnets and they're really, really cool. And, and there's all sorts of different shapes and sizes, and you could build incredible things. And they're really, really cool until you try to put them together like, like this. Because they, they won't stick. Now, the way a magnet works is that it has a positive side and a negative side. 
And I know what you're, mad at you're immediately thinking on this metaphor. I'm the positive one. <laughs> I love where this is going. I'm the positive one. And, and you can try to stick these poles together, the ones that are alike. If we're going to use the birds of feather flock together metaphor, it does not work here. The two that are alike do not connect. But in fact, there's this, this powerful magnetic pole. If you can see it in the back. If you get close enough with a magnet, it will actually flip it around and pull it towards itself. Negative to positive. North pole to south pole. Coming together. And it's this compelling phenomenon, this compelling narrative. We, we love it in so many different arenas, and we see it in other arenas as life. It's not just magnets. We see it like, like with memes and pictures, you know, like, like when you see things that aren't supposed to be together come together, like a dog and a cat. Like, like we have some pictures of the most endearing things, and I don't know if that's not cute to you. You're not human. But this isn't supposed to happen. Dogs are supposed to eat cats, but when, when the rules of nature don't work, it's compelling. In fact, sometimes it's provocative and inviting. We, we love stories of love like this, Romeo and Juliet. How many of you love the 90s version with Leonardo DiCaprio? We got a picture of it. Oh my goodness. I'm going to just straight up admit it. I love that movie. I mean, I became a huge Shakespeare fan after this film. Go MTV, right? Like, you put anything into an MTV format, and I'm all in. And it, star crossed lovers, two people who should never be connected, adamantly opposed to each other. They, they, they have this gravitational pull, and opposites attract, and it is fascinating. When we see it in normal day to day life like this, uh, this next photo. We see it in, in, in human relationships of that, that, uh, people that we know, like these two. Um, I mean, if, if you know me and you know my wife, you know we do not belong together. Like, we are polar opposites. And, and you see this all the time, right? Where extroverts will be attracted to introverts or adventurous people will be totally attracted to boring people or people who are... <laughs> who are super smart, are really attracted to really stupid people. And, and there's, there's all of these things where people who like, like really love safety are attracted to dangerous people. And, and it's this crazy phenomenon. But in fact, it, sometimes it's what, what some psychologists say is actually the, 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 the recipe, the fuel for chemistry. It's actually the, the formula that makes it work, that, that we can complement each other. It, these would be these complementarian type traits. And, and it's this crazy thing. And, and I wonder if, I wonder if this concept or if this phenomenon of opposites attract is the way of Jesus. I wonder if this phenomenon of opposites attract is the way of the kingdom. What would happen? What would happen if we as a people, at least us as Mosaic, us as a church, and instead of being repulsive or repelling those who are different from us, what if we had this gravitational type pull where we were magnetic and when we got close to people who were different than us, we were so compelling that we actually could not yell, but attract each other. What if we could actually step into the space of controversy and agony and actually learn how to love each other the way Jesus invites us to. What if we stopped demonizing and dehumanizing people who were not like us, who thought different than us, who stood on the other side of the fence or across the other side of the aisle. 
What if instead of trying to demand that we are heard, if we took heard and took on the posture of being the one who listens? Well, what would happen if we became the kind of community where opposites attract? Because Jesus did that. And he's called us to do that. In Matthew 5, verse 43, he says, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemies. If he was saying it now, he'd say, you've heard that it was said, birds of a feather flock together. He would say, those who are like you, to love your neighbors, the ones who are like you, the ones who align with you, the ones who agree with you. But I say, to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you might be children of your Father in heaven, that you might be citizens of this kingdom that's different than the empire that we live in. Jesus never surrounded himself with people like him. He never surrounded himself with people who agreed with him or, or who just were, like, were exactly like him, well, partly because there was no one like him. But he surrounded himself with sinners and tax collectors, Samaritans, women, prostitutes, lepers. The list goes on. He even surrounded himself with religious people, like the Pharisees, the Sadducees. But it was very rare that he criticized them, made them feel small, dehumanized them, spoke out against them. Is it even possible for us to be like this? I want you to think right now about your Facebook friend who you just unfriended. I I do. I want you to think about your enemy right now. I want you to think of them by name. I I know a lot of you are thinking of the same person right now. Oh, I want Oh, I do. I want you to think about the person who cannot be any more different than you. And you don't know what to do with it. In fact, I believe that there are some of you in the room, you have broken hearts over lost friendships and relationships or disconnections from your family because of current events, things where you found out that you may stand somewhere different than someone else and well, you know you love them, you, you aren't quite sure what to do. I want you to think about that person. Or maybe it's not even a person, maybe it's just a value, a system, a way of thinking, maybe it's an ideology that you stand adamantly opposed. I want you to think of it now. Close your eyes, think of it. That's your enemy. I want you to keep that thing or that person. You can open your eyes. I want you to think of this as we walk through the how do we become magnetic? How do we become the type of people where opposites attract, where we don't repel each other like magnets do when things like themselves are near each other, but instead flip it around and attract the people, the things that are opposite from us. What if you changed your tune and could actually get through to them and be known and be heard by them? Uh, I believe there's three simple ways, and this is just my elementary mind, uh, figuring out how we can step into this together. I think step one is we need to become curious. I think... Contrary to some of our beliefs or or our assumptions, when we look at Jesus, we think, oh man, Jesus came, he was the answer to all of the world, he was the answer to life, and he certainly was, but Jesus didn't show up with a lot of answers. In fact, he showed up with mostly questions. If you do the math, I use Google for this because I'm not good at math, but if you do the math, Jesus is actually not the ultimate answer man. He didn't come with all the answers or all the solutions or all the things to this or that. What Jesus came with was a whole bunch of questions. In fact, when you look throughout the Gospels, you you want to call Jesus the great answer man. You call him the great questioner. In the Gospels, 
Jesus asks far more questions than he gives answers. In fact, the numbers show that Jesus asks 307 questions in the Gospels. People ask him 183 questions. And he answers three of them. And so if we're going to use Jesus as our true north, if we're going to use Jesus as the one that we should model our lives after, the ones that we should become like, the ones that we should be transformed into, then we must become a people who were curious. A people who long to understand and learn, long to listen, long to know those who are different from us. If... That's difficult for you. It's usually because of two reasons, either arrogance or ignorance. And usually the two come together. But arrogance is this mindset that you actually know it all. And I know where many of you stand. And I know some of you personally by name. I could call you out, but I won't. But you are so educated. You are so well-versed. You are so up on the issues. And you could spit them out. You could rattle them off. And you are so vetted in your stance because you know what's up. But what you don't know is why the person you're disagreeing with even holds to the values that they have. You don't know why they're there or what their experience has been or if they have a different perspective for us. And if we can step into a posture of curiosity, I think we can move from this place of ignorance. I think our ignorance is what makes us so contentious towards each other. We think we know the issues and the things, but we don't know personally. We can, we can make a decision about someone before we ever step into a conversation. Our minds are made up before we're even willing to meet up and ask. We are not curious people. Many of us, we are, we are hard-headed and unwilling to even open our lives up. And so step one is to be curious. And this is the thing that I do love about this church, more than any other environment that I've ever been in. We are a curious crowd. In fact, we, we model this on our staff. And we have a couple things, that, that, that postures that, that we mandate, that we use towards each other. One is this posture of tell me more. Just the first thing out of our mouths all the time, tell me more. When you don't understand, when you're against each other, when you don't agree, it's like, I'm not quite with you. Tell me more. And then we also practice this thing called vetting our narratives. This thing where, where we, can, we can create the narrative. We can project onto each other why they did what they did or why they're feeling a certain way or they did this because I did this and they're doing this because of this. You might be right, but you're probably wrong. And so what we practice as a staff is we vet our narratives. We come to each other in conflict and we say, I think you did this because of this. Am I right? And it's usually a phenomenal time to become educated on how wrong we actually are. And sometimes it's just small tweaks and adjustments. But sometimes there is a chasm between our true understanding and what is truly real. And I think if we could step into that with each other, with those who are different from us, that we would actually have so much to learn. Step number two is be compelling. That sounds easy, right? Be compelling. I got to tell you right now, the loud yelling match and noise that's happening on social media right now and through the news is not compelling. It is not inviting. It is not attractive. It is not thought-provoking. It is not inviting. It is just noise. What would happen if we changed our tune and we move from being not only curious, which I actually think would help us to move into the second thing, which is to become compelling. What would it look like for us to be compelling? You know, one of the things that I think is so fascinating about Jesus as we say all the time, well, Jesus, he, he, he ate with sinners and with, with prostitutes and tax collectors. And he was with all of these people who shouldn't have, he shouldn't have been spending with. Which is, it's great, but you can go, he was God. It was easy for him, right? What's more compelling to me, what's more interesting is not that he spent time with them, but that they actually spent time with him. Like, 
There was no reason why they should have been attracted to him. Because he challenged them. He convicted them. He made them think and face things in their lives that they had never faced before. There was no reason why they should have even stayed in his vicinity. Because he represented everything that would be against who they were at the core. But yet Jesus had something that was so compelling about him that not only did he attract those who were the outcasts, the sinners, the ones who who should not have been in the vicinity of a rabbi, those who were outside of his camp, but he also challenged the status quo inside of his camp with the Jewish leaders, with the people that were of his race and ethnicity and creed. And he made it very uncomfortable for them He, in fact, many times rebuked and challenged them, drew lines in the sand. Yet they were still drawn to him and curious, compelled by him. What would happen if we were like Jesus in Luke 15, 1? It says, now the tax collectors and the sinners were all drawing near to him. Those who were opposed to him, against him, those who should not have been near him, they were drawn to him. And even the Pharisees and the scribes were close by. They were drawn too, even though they grumbled. This man receives sinners and eats with them. What if we can become magnetic, compelling? Well, we didn't repel those who were different from us, but we compelled and we drew and we attracted those who were different than us. Let our differences be attractive, not reactive. Let our differences initiate conversation, not accusation. Let us be the kind of people where our curiosity becomes the very thing that makes us compelling to each other. And people constantly are fighting to be heard instead of earning the right to speak. And I think there's a massive difference between fighting to be heard, being loud and being obnoxious and being noisy or earning the right to speak. Step number three is be committed to love. Step number one is be curious. Step number two is Be compelling. Step number three is be committed. Be committed to love. Love is not the way you feel about people in your own camp. It's so easy to to just love people who are like me. I love people who agree with me. It's so easy. You have this affection, this chemistry, this bond with people who are like you. That isn't love at all. No, that's affection. It's cheap. In fact, it's free. It doesn't cost you anything. But love is a choice to move towards those who are unlike us and serve them even when it makes us cringe. We are misguided when we feel like love is just this compelling force that would amazingly attract us to each other. No, love only becomes a force when we choose it and we apply it to those who should not receive it. The scriptures say this in Luke 6, 27. But to you who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies. For those of you who are very uh, much in a camp, this would be the people in the other camp, your enemies. Whatever the issue is, do good to those who hate you. And they do. Bless those who curse you. They do. I see it happen in front of me. The comment thread is the most devastating thing to humanity. Pray for those who hurt you. If someone slaps you on the one cheek, offer the other cheek also. 
If someone demands your coat, offer them your shirt. Give to anyone who asks. And when things are taken from you, don't try to get them back. Do to others as you would like them to do to you. If you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? I love this. Even sinners do that. Pat yourself on the back. You love the people in your camp? Good for you. Even sinners do that. It's not only good for you to love those who do good to you. And if you lend money only to those who can repay you, why should you get credit? Even sinners will lend to other sinners for a full return. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great and you will truly be acting as children of the Most High. For he's kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. And you must be compassionate just as your Father is compassionate. If that's not challenging for you, we should hang out because I need some of that. But I know even outside of the political rhetoric and all of the stuff that's going on in our country, the disunity, the divide, the chasm that's being grown, I know that in my own personal life this week, I had to face this with my own family. Where I could not be more different than the cause of our crisis this week. I could not be more upset and infuriated and frustrated and entitled with the pain that was caused to my family because of one poor choice. And I did. I I flew into the other side of the country, guns blazing, angry and upset, and God dealt with me in a hospital bed. At that moment, this family member of mine had become my enemy and God spoke to me and said, love him. And I just wonder for us as a people, how much pain, how much disconnection, how much bitterness is propagated in our own lives because we are unwilling to heed the words of Jesus to choose to step in to the crisis, to step into the controversy, into the battle with love and with grace and with elegance. And I think that so many times we long to change the system. We long to change the the forces that are around us. And we think if we could get through to this or fight for this or petition this or protest this, that that we might actually get through. But when you look at Jesus, he actually never, ever tried to overthrow the political system. He actually could care less about Rome. We think America's evil. We think the decisions our leaders are making, no matter what side of the field you're on, is evil. I mean, there is nothing more evil than the Roman Empire. The very context that Jesus lived and walked in, yet he never addressed it. In fact, the only thing he said about it was, give to Caesar what's his. He didn't come in with laws that would be changed or or try to create policies. He didn't even try to operate inside of the construct or the conventions of the Roman Empire. No, what, what he did was much more subversive. He, he didn't operate by their systems or engage in their politics. No, he, he wasn't a politician. He was a practitioner. And he created a movement, a magnetic, compelling, inviting movement that would outlast his time on earth and would become the very mechanism for God to do his work in this world. It's called the church. Nations rise and fall. Systems collapse. But the church has remained. 
The church has made it through every rise and fall, every government, every system, everything, because the people of God have found a way to remain committed to loving those who are unlike them, to being committed to those who are different than them. If you're in Christ, your allegiance is to the kingdom of God. You are a citizen of heaven. And Colossians 3 invites us to this in verse 13. It says, bear with each other and forgive one another. I believe there's some forgiveness needed this morning, even between us. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, over all of these virtues, put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity. God's plan for us, his desire for us, is that we would be unified, not divided. And I want to end with this, because I think in the climate that we're in, this will be a good word for us, Titus 3. Chapter 3. This is good. So remind the believers to submit to the government and its officers. They should be obedient, always ready to do what is good. They must not slander anyone and must avoid quarreling. Instead, they should be gentle and show true humility to everyone. Once we too, we were foolish and disobedient. We were misled and became slaves to many lusts and pleasures. Our lives were full of evil and envy, and we hated each other. But when God, our Savior, revealed his kindness and love, he saved us. Not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Because of His grace, He made us right in His sight and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. And this is a trustworthy saying. And I want you to insist on these teachings so that all who trust in God will devote themselves to doing good. These teachings are good and beneficial for everyone. Do not get involved in foolish discussions on Facebook about spiritual pedigrees or in quarrels and fights about obedience to Jewish laws. These things are useless and a waste of time. If people are causing divisions among you, give a first and a second warning. After that, unfriend them on Facebook. Have nothing more to do with them. For people like that have turned away from the truth and their own sins condemn them. I don't know about you, friends, but I need to hear that. I'm not up here standing you telling, I got this, follow my lead. No, this is an open conversation about who we need to become, but how we should be as a people. I would love if this city and this world knew the church to be the most magnetic, compelling, inviting, inspiring, and life-changing entity in the universe. That's our commission as a people. I believe if we can practice these things, and it's going to take a lot of practice. We've got to be curious. If you're afraid of someone, of an ideology, of a person, of another religion, you need to get to know someone who is that to you. You need to find a friend who's a Muslim or who's gay or whatever your fears are, whatever they might be, you must move towards friendship and understanding. Be curious. And don't be a jerk. Be compelling. Be magnetic. 
listen and know and learn. And then be committed. We're going to need all the commitment we can take. We've got to be committed to love. And we cannot do it on our own might. We cannot do it in our own power. We need the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. And so if you're here this morning and you need some help, like I do, I want you to know that we are here together as a people, that you belong before you believe any of this, that you don't have to agree with us to be with us, that this is a place where we can work it out. And when we fail, we pick each other up and we extend grace. We don't hold each other to these letter of this law, but we just figure it out together. And so this morning during the last song, in fact, if you guys would all stand, I'm going to pray. We're going to worship through one last song. But if you're here this morning and you need prayer, you need some help. Maybe you know you need to forgive someone. If they're here, go do it. If they're not, move towards it this week. If you need the courage or the strength to do that, we want to invite you to come forward to be prayed for. We'd love to pray for you. If you're here this morning and you just want to pray for our nation or for our church or for whatever it might be, our prayer team's in the front. We'd love for you to come pray. But most importantly, there's a guy named Jesus that we've been talking about this whole morning. And if you're here and you've never connected to Christ and you want to know more, now is the time to come forward. We'd love to talk with you and pray with you. We, as we sung earlier, we believe his spirit's here and is moving and that God might be speaking to you through some of this conversation. And we don't want to miss the opportunity to invite you to step into a relationship with Jesus. It's the only way that we could do any of this. The only way that we could actually be magnetic and compelling, be a force of love in this world. And so if you want to be a part of that, we want to invite you to that. Let's pray. God, we thank you, Lord, for your grace. God, that you love us so much, even though we've got it so wrong. And we're going to continue to fumble. We're going to continue to fight. But God, your grace and your love is sufficient for us. God, I I thank you for this church. God, this is a special, 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 special place. God, there are people standing next to each other where it is unlikely and uncommon. God, we are compelled by your love. And God, we're really grateful that we can be a part of something like this. But God, we pray that we wouldn't keep it here. God, that we'd move out of these walls and that this week we would change our tune, change our tone, change the way that we react and relate with each other. God, so that we could ultimately love our enemies, pray for those who persecute us, do good to those who hurt us. God, so that we can be an example of your love. God, we should be seen as your enemies, disconnected and divided from you. But God, you sent your one and only son to stand in that gap, to live a perfect and sinless life, God, to go die on the cross or raise again from death, conquering it once and for all so that we might live. God, so that when we are in Christ, even when we mess up, you see us through his perfection. You call us heirs, your children, your saints. So God, we thank you, Lord, for viewing us like that. May we see each other the same. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's worship. Please feel free to come forward for prayer. We'd love to pray with you. Let's worship. Thanks for listening to the Mosaic San Diego podcast. For more information on gathering times and the Mosaic community, visit our website at mosaicsd.org.